It's hot and it's getting hot pepper time. I know these make you a little bit nervous. We might have to do another hot pepper tasting show. Uh, these is a cayenne right here. Yeah. And uh, I'm thinking about doing a two minute tip or video. Somebody a while back asked um, how we make red pepper flakes with these, to put on pizzas and Italian dishes. So um, if, you know, people can put in the comments there if they'd like to see that video on how we make the red pepper flakes. So that's, that's normally the one we make pepper sauce out of. You can't, yeah, yeah, but, and I'm, this might be another video I do on making pepper sauce. These Serranos here make a fine, fine pepper sauce. Um, so these aren't, these just got a little bit of heat to them, um, about like a jalapeno. I like slicing these up fresh, putting them on tacos. They're good. And then we got a, uh, I didn't bring one, Miss Hoss has got some down there, those Brazilian orchids. Um, that I'm waiting to try. Excited about those. Those no, what's the really, heat on those? Those are supposed to be uh, pretty tantalizing. Tantalizing. Um, and then we're going to talk about these a little later in the show. Uh, That's what got a question place. about these these Aruba Cuban nails mm -hmm. here and how productive they are. But yep. let's say hey to everybody first. Right. Hello everyone and welcome to the Row by Row Garden Show. I'm Travis and I'm Greg and we're really excited to have you with us tonight. We got a really good show planned. We're going to try to catch up on some of all these questions you've been putting on the um, in the comment section on our show and just have a big q a segment uh, yeah. this week and uh, answer a lot of frequently asked questions just kind of go through those but before we do that we always like to talk about what's going on around here uh, and i want to talk a little bit about some videos that we had come out recently um, we had your blue bayou pumpkin video yep. come out last week and a nice big harvest on those. Yeah, we're going to have a follow-up to that. So I'm going to give them a little bit to cure out. Then we're going to cook some of them. Yeah, so a lot of people are excited to see what the inside of those yep. look like. And uh, actually how much meat's inside of them. From the weight of them, it don't feel like there's a lot of empty space in nope. there. And then I had a um, earlier this week a two-minute tip talking about our gynoecious cucumbers. and the. Well, I wish I could say that word. And the uh, Stonewall variety yeah. in particular. and uh, I just call them gynos. Gynos, that yeah. works. Somebody that calls works. in and I said, you need to plant some new gynos. Yeah, that works. That works. They'll know what you're talking they about. They know what I'm talking about, yeah. Um, some of the questions we had following up to that video. So I mentioned in that video that the way the gynoecious cucumbers work is in that packet of seeds. And I forget how many. Say we put 50 in there. Um one in every 10 seeds is a regular OP variety. And it'll be a different color. Well, not in ours, it's not a different color. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. Some some places do uh, differ the color. Maybe I'm thinking about watermelons. I don't know what I'm thinking about. Yeah. yeah. I've seen that before where there's different color seeds in the seed pack. I've heard of folks doing that. Ours are not a okay. different color. Um, so one in every 10 seeds is an OP variety. For instance, with the stone wall, it's probably something like a market more. And we did have a lot of people ask, well, what if I'm just planting four or five seeds? Well, there's your caveat. With these gynoecious varieties, to, to, ma to get the production and maximize it, you, you almost want to plant a whole row or almost a whole pack. Um, now, what you could do, if you wanted to, if you're just going to plant a few, a little short row, you could get you a pack of stone walls and get you a pack of market moors and, and make sure you get the pollinizer there that would work but mm -hmm. uh you know if you just plant one or two cucumber plants i don't know that that gynoecious variety is going to work for you because it's really about maximizing the production along that whole entire road cucumbers is one of the, i enjoy cucumbers out of the garden when they come in Woo! man i love them they good and uh, mm -hmm. this is the latest i've ever been able to grow cucumbers and i need to do a video on this but i've been spoon feeding them with some of that 20 20 20 micro boost and man i got leaves as big as lily pads out there big as lily pads yeah so they pretty they yeah. pretty um what else speaking of cucumbers now i'm glad i got mine trellis because i got them rats we talked about last week they've been eating on the bottom ones mm -mm. and if anybody knows me uh well at all they know that i'm highly allergic to cats indoor cats if i go to somebody's house who's got a cat inside i'll start swelling up sneezing just just having a fit 
I didn't know that. You, you didn't. You don't know me very well. No, did I didn't. Uh, I knew you was allergic to horses. But horses, cats, indoor cats. Um, but I'm highly considering. We was at the pet store the other day, just playing around with the kids, killing time. I'm highly considering getting me an outside barn cat to take care of these rats out there. It's, yeah, if you get a good barn cat, you need to make sure you don't get them from the pet store. You don't want no hybrid. You need you a barn cat to come from a barn cat. Well, yeah, but I, the, the, if you get them from the humane side, they're only about $75, and that's the same what you're going to pay if you get one and get it fixed. I want it fixed. I don't want big breeding cats out there. You don't want raised barn cats. Yeah, gotcha. um, but but like you was alluding to, I was telling my buddy about that, and he said, "Don't buy a cat." He said, "You yeah. can get a cat from somebody. Yeah. Don't buy a well, cat." Well, cats are easy to come by. <laughs> anyway, I'm liable to get me a barn cat, so we'll, we'll stay tuned for that. Uh, anything new going on in your garden? I'm doing some cleaning up our area. My garden's about over with. I got some flowers planted, sunflowers and zinnias prettiest crop I've ever had coming along. However, watermelons is gone, my tomatoes are just about gone, blue bayous is gone. The only thing I got producing in the garden is vegetable-wise okra. I'm making okra like crazy. Everything else I'm in the process of cleaning up, doing away with so I don't harbor any diseases or insects, and I'm gonna get everything tidied up, pretty up, and get ready for my fall planting. That's what I've been doing. I'm in that kind of clean up, fed up phase. like. Got I got my tomatoes out there. I pulled up some more squash, even though they were still getting. I was still getting a few squash here and there. Pulled them up yesterday. Get them out of there. Yeah. Get it cover crop cleaned up. Cover mm -hmm. crop. I'm, I'm gonna fix the plastic cover crops, but I'm telling you, and I we got some things going on with these zinnias and sunflowers. Out here. I'm just purely amazed at what they're how good they're looking. I have perfected my system on these zinnias and sunflowers where I've gotten. Pretty doggone good. Well, we might have to show everybody that yeah. on the video. Yeah. Uh, I did something yesterday I've never done before. I fertilized a cover crop. So um, I had a stand of, uh, we did a video showing the plant in it, uh, my sorghum sedan grass. It's about this tall. And it was in, <coughs> pro <coughs> excuse me, probably my sorriest performing plot in my new dream garden. And on one side of it, the, it looks nice and green, but parts of that plot just look kind of yellowish and, mm -hmm. and kind of nutrient deficient. So I took my injector and I put me some 20, 20, 20 and some micro boost in there and run it through the overhead tripod sprinkler last That's night and uh, see if I can green it up a little bit. I call that fertig fertigation. Fertigation. I also fertilized my figs yesterday. Yeah. Um, I didn't do it with injector because I just been hand watering them. I took me a five gallon bucket, made me a little concoction with some 20, 20, 20 micro boost. Yeah, it's probably not the most ideal time to fertilize a fig tree, but that's okay. Well, you really want to do it there in springtime to flush out that new growth weed. Well, they were they look growing. like they need a little help. I understand that. And some micro boost would have probably been in order. I wouldn't hit them with a lot of nitrogen right now. Well. Uh, they look like they need a little help, so you might need to get with me on that next time. For okay, you, we okay. Some fish <laughs> I got you. I got you. Um, one more thing, we've got a lot of um, going to be adding a lot of new seed varieties yes, coming we up. Got some, I've been working in the seed room. We're revamping back there, putting some new, getting some new shelves in. We're fixing to really do up our seed business this coming year. We got a lot of exciting things coming. Yeah, so um, lots of stuff we're adding for fall, and we'll probably do a whole show on our new seed stuff, but just to go over, uh, we got a couple of varieties of spinach. We're adding several varieties of cabbage, leek seed, and uh, onion seed. And onion seed. Um, we, we grew leeks from transplants last year. I'm excited about growing my own leeks this year. Um, those are day neutral, so we can plant those anytime yep. once it cools off. We got four more varieties of lettuce coming in, three of those pelleted. Got some of that Cherokee lettuce that everybody raves about being heat tolerant. Um, we're going to do some pelleted beets and some pelleted carrots. Yes, we are. That's going to be exclusive to us. That's right. Um, so On the pelleted part of it. Right. So we'll still have the raw versions of the seed, but we'll also have pelleted, pelleted ones as well. So lots of good stuff coming uh, seed-wise. And then the last thing I want to mention before we get into the questions, 
uh, as far as a future show topic. So I, a lot of people always on our videos are comment, what do you do with all that produce? That's got to be way too much. There's no way you can eat all that or whatever. So I, I haven't talked much about it, kind of kept it under wraps, but my wife and I do have a um, kind of a, it's kind of like a CSA, but not really, but a weekly uh, kind of vegetable bag operation we do. Um, kind of like a little small market farm deal. And it started out as just kind of a trial test and it's been going for a few years and it's running pretty good now. So if that's something you would like to hear about on a future show, uh, we can talk about kind of the, the history of market farming and then I can give you kind of my model and what works in my area because it may or may not work in your area. So if that's something you'd like to hear about on a future show, our kind of market farming, sales model, whatever, um, let us know in the comments and we'll be glad to do a show on it. So I just give all my stuff away. Yeah. Whatever I grow, I just give it away. All right. Who I am, what I do. Yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, you got a lot of folks like... Needy folks. Needy folks, needy folks. yeah. I got a lot of needy friends. Yeah. Okay. All right, so this week, main topic of the show we're going to bounce through a bunch of these questions that y'all been asking on the comments and and as always keep flooding those questions in we love to see them it kind of gives us an idea of what we should talk sure. about what we should make videos we about. love having that conversation with our customers and our viewers because it gives us an understanding of what we need to cover and and what we need to do to better support you so if you got problems then we know we, we can do something to help you with those problems give you some advice or products or support or whatever all right, and, and we promised we was going to give away a couple hats. A couple hats, and, and I may need to get me one of them hats. Yeah, yours is, is on the last what leg. I got to do, what have I got to do to get me a hat? Well, hat. you got to work harder well, around work here. Harder. Okay. Um, so we got 12 questions here we're going to go through, yep. and at the end of it, we're going to draw names from these 12, mm -hmm. and uh, we'll send those two people a hat. You can get the camouflage one, or you can get the red one. Or the charcoal one. Or the charcoal one. Which, Not quite this charcoal, but... Yeah, it looks better new. It looks a lot better. Okay, so let's go through these. I'll start off, uh, okay. read your first question here. So the first one is from Swanee Thrift, and she says, or maybe it's he, uh, I'm going to try the clover for her honeybee population. I was also looking at the Austrian pea. want to know if the Austrian pea is edible to humans and how will it work with honeybees. Austrian pea is a wintertime pea. Mm -hmm. So you want to plant it in cooler or cold weather, and it can take down to 10 degrees with minor injuries. So it's one can, of the most cold hardy. It can take some cold weather. It's, it would not be my first choice for, for a pollinator, although it does extend the season a little bit. For It works fine for bees. It would be my first choice if I was planting just for bees. They are edible. It's normally planted as a cover crop because it has so much biomass. To answer your question, uh, Yes, you can plant them for honeybees. It does extend the season a little bit with the, the nice flowers they have on. It is edible. Its main, its main attributes is the biomass and also the nitrogen fixation because we know it is a legume. So it, it was bred, it was claimed to fame as a cover crop, but it does have other benefits. And, and to, to piggyback on that a little bit, with most cover crops, even though you could eat it, we want to get them in before they go to seed or extinguish them. So, <clears throat> um, yeah, and if you got a deer problem, you don't want to plant these because the deer absolutely love them. They'll eat them up. If you're trying to, you know, bring the deer in, which most people are not in the garden situation, this is a, <laughs> it's a good one to plant. They'll travel miles just to eat some of these peas in the wintertime. Hmm. They love them. All right, question number two from Jimmy Atterbury, and I'm gonna need some help on this one. Well, you just go with it. Well, they it'll say, be on the screen so they, they can read Big it. word there. Okay. Jimmy says, question with a big word. You have question <clears throat> with a big word. Have you looked at allopathic? Allelopathic. Allelopathic plants. I read an article about it and was wondering your thoughts. Say it one more time. Allo Allelopathic. Allelopathic. All right, Jimmy. So glad you asked this question, and we could probably do a whole show on this in the future if we can figure out 
you can figure out how to pronounce it. So allelopathy, let's define it first and then we'll get it. So allelopathy is defined as the inhibition of growth in one species of plants by chemicals produced by another species. So you've got to plant the soil, it produces a certain chemical that's going to inhibit the growth of some other plant nearby um, there. Okay, and specifically this is important as it relates to cover crops. Uh, there's a lot of research out there about the allelopathic qualities of cover crops and I wanted to mention a few specific examples. Um, your peas, like you were talking about earlier, and your vetches are known to be allelopathic to lamb's quarter, yellow nut sedge, and morning glory. So for those of you that have nut grass problems out there, um, you know, doing a winter cover crop of your peas and your vetch, maybe even mix them together, help you with your nut sedge problem or nut grass problem. I did not know that. That's good. Buckwheat. Buckwheat is allelopathic to pigweed. That's why you don't see a lot. But the, what they say though is that the chemical that inhibits the pigweed is actually in the buckwheat stem. So a lot of times you don't get that allelopathic action until it's chopped up or incorporated. So if you got a bad pigweed problem, Get you some buckwheat. Say that word one more time for me. Allelopathic. And then the last one here, uh, clover, crimson clover, is known to be um, allelopathic to morning glory and wild mustard. And I got a two minute tip coming up on morning glory and how bad it is. So um, lots of good options, cover crops there as far as keeping the weeds down, not just shading them out like we think about it, but actually some, some chemical action there to prevent them. And it's called what? Allelopathy. <clears throat> All right. Third question is from Undertaker the Dead Man. He must be a wrestling fan. Mm -hmm. um, he says he's out in the melon patch, seen a lot of deformed melons in there coming off the vine and that are not that sweet. What's causing this problem for his melons? Be as I am the melon guru around here. The melon man. The melon man around here. Two problems come to mind. Poor pollination and uh, infrequent watering. Those two things can cause misformed shape and can cause some other problems. That's the two biggest issues we see in growing watermelons. Watermelons do not take dry spells very well or inconsistent water. And that's the reason it's very important to be successful growing watermelons is to use the drip tape. Put it underneath there and that way you can shoot the water to it right where they need it. Everything works wonderful. Pollinators, you got to have pollinators growing these melons, whether it be cantaloupe, watermelon, musk melons, whatever. It is a must unless you have floods of natural pollinators, which most of, all don't, uh, most of us don't, then you got to have pollinators. And po fruits without pollinators can come off as misformed or oblong, or they just rot off at the stem. A lot of times we'll see them to a set fruit and they'll rot right off poor pollination. Good job. Yep. What we got next? Okay. Next, we got CeeLo. Uh, CeeLo. CeeLo says, I've been gardening down here in Central Florida for years. Been thinking about going drip tape instead of sucker hose and overhead water. What vegetables do best on drip tape or can I go straight to drip tape for everything? So CeeLo, um, we use it on just about everything. I don't use it on Irish potatoes, um, but... I use it pretty much on just about everything else. Um, it works great. It, you know, the obvious benefits for, for making the transition f uh, to drip tape are the time it's going to save you and the water conservation. But the most prevalent thing we hear from people who switch to drip tape is that they're amazed at how many fewer weeds they have in their garden when they start using drip tape and quit overhead watering so much. Um, you know, the, like I said, the, the water conservation, the time is obvious, but the, the reduction in weed pressure will blow your mind and also disease pressure too, especially in things like yep. cucurbit squash. If I had to divide it out, this is, well, I've said this before, the most important thing to use drip tape is your high value crops, peppers, tomatoes, things like that. Of course, corn to me is a high value crop. A low value crop is one that comes off quick and if I was not going to use drip tape, it's be on low value crop. Those are squash, summer squash, because they come off in 45 to 50 days. Your winter squash, definitely, I would go with drip tape on those. But your things that grow real quick, 
would be something that I would maybe not lean to as much on drip tape. But those things that take 85 to 110 days, you definitely want drip tape on those. Yeah, or things that are heavy feeders, like yeah. a lot of water. All right. Question number five from Gerald White. He wants to know what was the fig we talked about that has the closed end and keeps the bugs out? There's over 600 varieties of figs out there, believe it or not, worldwide. There's a bunch of them. If you're interested and you live in the South specifically, and you're interested in doing a little bit of research on fig trees, look up LSU varieties. LSU did some work uh, a few years ago on creating some new varieties of figs. And the one that they come up with that they say is virtually bulletproof with the closed eye is the LSU purple. Now there are some more that they got that's got different flavor profiles. And if you got a few minutes, you may want to Google that, look up and see the different ones they got. They got some gold ones and things like that. See which one you think you may like the best. And uh, these are some great varieties and most of them have a closed eye. Most of them produce more than some of the older time varieties. And uh, the purple is one I'm growing that I'm really excited about. I've got a purple planted as well. Good stuff there. All right. David Montgomery says, do you think the silage tarps would control nut sedge? If the nut sedge couldn't grow through the tarp, do you think it would smother it out eventually? Well, David, <clears throat> the silage tarp is going to help you a little bit with nut sedge but not like it will with most of your other weeds. Um, nut sedge is a perennial, it's extremely resilient. And the problem with nut sedge is, is you got those nuts underneath the ground there. Um, so you can kill off the nut grass foliage with the tarp. You may knock it back a little bit, but it's not gonna completely eradicate it like it will some of these other more kind of surface weeds. Um, to really get rid of nut grass, and, and I, I say this a lot, you got to aggravate the soil. You just got to keep aggravating them, keep them. Some people will just till the fire out of it. That works. And these uh, cover crops work good too to help. Uh, yeah, and but the the repeated wheel hoeing works for me. Um, we mentioned earlier that the the Austrian peas and the vetches are allelopathic to nut sedge, so you might want to consider planting some of those. You know, in the the fall as a cover crop, then tarping, you know, that, that would put you on your way to help and solve that problem. Okay. You're up now. Kumi Ori Farm says, how heavy are those silage tarps? Can one person fold it up and carry it to storage? Yes and no. How big a boy are you? How big a boy are you? So they weigh about 60 <laughs> pounds. I actually, pick up a lot of them and put them in the box when we're doing them back here myself, but I'm pretty good sized boy. Yeah. And I have by myself. You do, you do strain a little bit. I do Make a little noise. I make a little it. noise, but that's okay. I did put one I, in my garden out there. I did fold one out right by myself. It was not a windy day. If it's a windy day, it can be a little bit of a problem. I unfolded out mine out and, and put the sandbags in. It didn't have much of a problem. It's around 60 pounds. It's, a little, it's not like toting a box because it's flimsy. So it's a little aggravating toting around. But yeah, one person can do it. And you put yours out by yourself also. I did. I did. I would say either have somebody help you to carry it to the garden or if you got a buggy or oh, a truck. Yeah. Yeah. I just backed the truck right up to my garden, unloaded it. It's easy to fold out by yourself, but it is a little unwieldy just because it's it's slicker. It's hard to get a hold to it. It's if not you like got two handles. people, that's the ideal thing. Um, but when you're putting it out, if you'll hold put your bricks or your sandbags on one side of it and get it held down, you can roll it out in no time. Yep. All right, and then Josh Ward says, can we order bigger tarps if we pay the extra shipping cost? Okay, so the tarps, when they get to us, they're on these huge rolls. They're over 100 pounds. One person can't, unless you're a strong man, but uh, it takes me and him both to move them around. So. Uh, when we cut them, we fold them up so they fit in a box and they're easier to ship. If you did want one of the big ones, you'd have to be able to receive truck freight at your house. They have to yep. ship truck freight. We could do it, but you'd we, have to call in. We'd get you a quote and all. It's possible. Yeah, so it's possible, and you, you're going to need to be there to help whoever it is to unload it. Right. There, it's a two-man job. Yep, it's oh. over the 70-pound threshold for UPS. The 50 by 100s, they're heavy. Okay. Um, next one here. 
Jerry Bryant. He says, speaking of figs, I just rooted some in water, placed them in pot and soil. Um, what are some of the things he needs to do when planting in the yard? Should he plant it this fall, amend? Give yes and yes. So I always like to plant fruit trees and things like that in the fall because it gives them a chance to get started. I got a friend that's wanting a fig tree right now that I got rid of it, and I told her, I said, hold off. Don't plant it now. It's going to stress it out way too much. Hot, dry. Let's wait till this fall. Plant it. Give it a chance to get started. Grow over the wintertime. So yes, plant it in the fall of the year. I do like to mend the soils. I like to big, dig a bigger hole. I like to dig the hole twice as big as what the pot is. And I do like to amend it. Uh, if you got some peat moss, compost, compost is the best thing, anything like that. Especially if you got clay soils, amend those soils around where you're going to pot it at. When you plant it, plant it even to where it was at in the pot and go with it. Keep it watered. Keep it watered. That first year is very important that you keep it watered. Second, third year, it's more established, it's more drought resistant, but you got to keep the water on that first year. And one little trick that I did, I had plenty of five gallon buckets. So I drilled me a very small hole in the bottom of a five gallon bucket and I set it next to the fig tree. So when I'm watering, I just come out with my water hose, I fill up that five gallon bucket and it just drops it. Well, I say drop it out. It has a little small stream that comes out of there and waters it so it doesn't run off and it waters my fig tree. It's a little hack, hmm. fig tree hack hmm. for you there. Really? I've been watering mine, if we don't get any rain every other day, yeah. I water mine. All right. All right, Mr. Polecat5150 says, Hey, y'all, this is my first year messing with those Aruba peppers, and man, I have a ton of them coming in. They have zero insect pressure on them. Can I expect those to get, keep growing throughout the summer, kind of like a bell pepper and such? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. So these are our Aruba Cubanels here, and they'll get bigger than this, but this is about the size I pick them. They'll get twice as big. And uh, I will say this is my most productive variety of peppers. I grew about every pepper variety we carry, and I had grown these before. Um, these things will make and make and make. Right behind them would be the bananas, but these Aruba Cubanels are my most productive. I don't have any insect problems on mine either. They seem to be pretty resilient. Um, it is a hybrid variety designed to be really, really productive. And yeah, they'll keep making. Uh, I eat me a belly full of them other night stuffed. Yeah, huh. good stuff. What did you stuff them with? Sausage and cream cheese. Mm. Some bacon mm. around. Mm. Mm. All right, next one. Question number 11 from Kevin McCarthy. Any advice on Japanese beetles? Says he's got zinnias, basil, strawberries, roses, grapes, apple tree damage. Treated his lawn with some grub X. Uh, but wants to keep it organic in the garden. Pheromone traps seem to bring more in the yard. Um, any advice? Yes. First sign of attack, you want to start with neem oil and pyrethrin. Rotate them. Neem oil, pyrethrin. It's first sign of attack. Boom, boom, boom. Then stay after them. You're going to probably have to use some traps. And I say the traps like he's talking about where the pheromones come in and they actually trap them. And then another thing is good housekeeping. So as soon as those zinnias and things like that start to go out, they're not productive anymore, get rid of them. Get rid of that food source for them. Now you can't eat your apple tree and things like that. But what you can keep clean and keep tidy, you're going to take away from that uh, habitat for that insect so it moves along. So good housekeeping, neem pyrethrin. You may have to use some traps every now and then. Boom, boom. Boom, boom. Cameron Davis says, Oh, so this has been my first year garden spot. So obviously I want the best outcome for my next year. So should I tarp then a cover crop in the off season winter or cover crop then tarp? Okay. And we've had a lot of people asking this on, uh, after we talked about the tarp, should they tarp cover crop, cover crop and tarp? Yep. This is what I would say. <clears throat> if you got a new garden spot, if you've got a way to get it cleaned up, if you can get in there with a tiller, if you can get that grass out of there. If you can get it cleaned up, relatively clean to plant, clean it up, plant a cover crop, then tarp it. If you don't have a way to till it and clean it up and you got some stubborn grass you just can't get rid of, tarp it during the heat of summer yep. and then fall, plant a fall cover crop and then tarp it again. Um, so if you can clean it up, Go ahead and get the cover crop in. It, it that's going to do you wonders. 
if you can't clean it up, use the tarp to help you clean it up. The very worst thing you can do is nothing and let weeds grow up out there. That's right. That's right. Do something. Do something. Do something. That's our new motto, do something. All right. So we had 12 questions there. Yep. 12 uh, people. And we're going to give away two hats. And so um, we're going to basically, we got these numbered in here. We're going to draw a number and then we'll match that up with the name on the question. Mm -hmm. And uh, if we draw your name, send us an email to cussserve at hosstools.com. Tell us which color you like, the uh, charcoal, the red, or the camo like I'm supposed to We need today. your address too, by the way. Yeah, we need your address. All right, so I'm not going to look. I'm not going to look either. Okay. Make sure I just got one there. Oh, that was question. Number one. So who was that? Number one. Swanee Thrift. Swanee Thrift. So Swanee Thrift, uh, let us know which color you want and uh, we'll get a hat to you. No, I'm not going to look. I'm going to draw one. And I draw number 12. How about that? One and 12. One and 12. Cameron Davis. Cameron. Cameron, send us your address and what color hat you like and we'll get you one in the mail. All right. So good Q&A show. Keep those questions and comments coming. We always like to see them. We, we, I kind of like the format of the show. We might do more of these in the yep. future. Um, hope you enjoyed watching the show tonight, and we will see you guys next week. Do something. Do it. Mm -hmm.